Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we begin a new sermon series, one that takes an in-depth look at one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. I have always loved this story. It's a story filled with everyday life, with the twists and turns that all of us have. And it's a story in scripture that has two women as the main characters, women who are lifted up for their loyalty and their wisdom, for their love, not for a man, but for each other. And you don't find very many stories like that about women in scripture. And so I love every opportunity I get to share this one. So for the next few weeks, we're going to dive into the book of Ruth, looking chapter by chapter for the lessons that we might learn from within this story. At its heart, I think the story of Ruth and Naomi is a story that represents God's love for us. So let me give you my version of the story in case you got lost in the reading a few moments ago because it's easy to do that. I'm going to set the scene for us a little bit. Our scripture begins right away by giving us a time and place. In the first verse, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. So we know right where we sit in time, right in between the time when the Israelites have finally made it into the promised land and before the first king, King Saul, was anointed. In this time in between, the land is ruled instead of by kings, by people called the judges. I'm, we know because I'm sure all of us have poured over every verse in the book of Judges, right? That, um, that the, judges, the time of the Judges was a time of chaos and anarchy, of decline and disobedience within Israel. In the book of Judges, we see that Israel takes turns, like all of us do, between faithfulness to God and unfaithfulness. At turns, they are obedient, and at turns, disobedient. Overall, though, the very last verse of the book of Judges tells us All of the people did what was good in their own eyes, which is code for the people were doing not very good things. The leadership over these unruly people, the judges, were both political leaders, making rulings just like our judges do, but also military leaders. They led armies in helping to continue to take over the promised land, which had previous owners before the Israelites got there. God regularly raises up these judges, military and political leaders to save Israel from their enemies, but they fall back into mayhem every time until God once again raises another judge from among them. So doing what was right in their own eyes is a direct denial of the law that had already been given to Israel. The law was given to them to promote life, life with God, and life in community. So Israel, in the book of Judges, fails to fulfill that law, and so they fall into chaos. So this is the context into which Ruth and Naomi walk into our story. Their story of belonging and blessing, about loss and faithfulness, about faithful love, which in in Hebrew, the word that's used here for faithfulness is hesed. It means loving kindness and faithfulness. God's faithfulness, incarnate in human beings, begins among the setting of chaos and unruliness that we find during the time of the Judges. If the book of Judges is mostly about the people of Israel not keeping the law, then the book of Ruth is about people going above and beyond the requirements of the law. So, we know the time, the time of the judges, and we also know from the first verse our place. We begin our story in Moab. Naomi and her husband and sons had been driven here when famine had come upon Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. So I just want to tell you for a second, there's a lot of irony in the beginning of this story because Bethlehem is the place that Naomi and her husband and sons had come from, literally the house of bread, that they left because of famine, And then they go back to, Ruth and Naomi go back to Bethlehem and find redemption there in the house of bread. A little bit of irony in the story. So they start the story in Moab and they leave Moab to go into Bethlehem. We discover right away that our main characters in the story are widows. Naomi is the mother-in-law. And we're told the very beginning that she has lost not only her husband, but her sons as well. Ruth is the daughter-in-law, and she, along with Orpah, the other daughter-in-law, are Moabites, foreigners. They're not Israelites. They have married Israelite men, but because they are foreigners, they do not have to follow the law. 
Naomi has heard a rumor, a glimmer of hope, that God has remembered his people in Bethlehem and provided for them despite the famine. So she decides to return home. Since their husbands have now died, Orpah and Ruth have the choice to go back to their parents. Now you heard um, in the section that Paula read this whole thing about if I had sons, are you going to wait for them? So just to remind you, the rule, uh, the law was that if your husband died and your husband had brothers, that you married the brothers in order to keep propagating the line. Naomi's, all of Naomi's sons have died, so there's no one else to marry. So they are now free to go back to their families where their uh, father will provide for them another husband. So this is the expected thing to do, is to go back home. And it's what Orpah ultimately chooses to do. Now let me just add an aside here, which is something I just think is interesting to know. Oprah Winfrey is named after Orpah, but her mother spelled it incorrectly. So if you ever need to remember who is who in the story, Orpah, Oprah, same thing. So Orpah ultimately chooses to go back to her family. Ruth, though, does the unexpected. It's Ruth who speaks some of what I think are the most lovely words in all of Scripture, especially when you read them in the King James Version. Whither thou goest, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Ruth demonstrates God's loving kindness, called hesed in Hebrew, to Naomi. In a time when she rightfully and lawfully could have left Naomi to return to her own people, it probably would have been the smarter thing to do. She would have been guaranteed someone to take care of her. They probably would have found somebody for her to marry quickly. Instead, she promises to stay with Naomi and is promised nothing. A widow without family had no guarantees, no place to go and get a job, no uh, time to be able to, um, take, to buy land, no resources. They were left to the mercy of those around them. And two widows together, even worse, and a little bit scandalous, which is why people are so surprised when they show up in Bethlehem a few verses later. They were left to the mercy of those around them. So Ruth, out of love or loyalty or a deep abiding sense of faithfulness, decides to accompany Naomi on her journey home. Now when I started writing this sermon a few days ago, I thought in my head that I would be focusing on Ruth. After all, she's the one who does these amazing things in the book, and the book is named after her. It is her actions that we should seek to use as our example. But as I read and prayed and read some more, I found myself more connecting with Naomi than with Ruth because I can get where she's coming from. Naomi is a woman with nothing left, a woman who has lost all that she loved, not only her husbands, but her two sons. She's lost those she loved, but she's also lost those that she could count on to care for her. In losing them, she has, in a sense, lost her livelihood. She certainly lost her sense of security, and she's found herself in a strange land. Empty of love, empty of security, empty of a home, and really empty of options. We hear in scripture that when she returns home, she tells them not to call her Naomi, which means pleasant, but to call her Mara, which means bitter. She is so empty that she has to change her name to mark that. And yet she decides to go home where she hears, because she hears this glimmer of a hope, a glimmer of a promise that God will provide. She doesn't want to take Ruth and Orpah to the fate that awaits her, one of probable begging and destitution, relying always on the kindness of strangers, who were already told at the beginning of the story do only what is right in their own eyes. So she tells them to go home to their parents, where they can be taken in and cared for, where they can have a future and remarry and have children. Orpah argues a little bit, but then agrees to go away. But Ruth declines and says she will go with her. But Naomi, instead of just saying, yes, please, I'd love to have some company on this journey, argues with her. She says to her, are you crazy? Seriously, you need to get a life. You need to find a husband. You need to have children. You need to have a family. And living with your mother-in-law is going to make all of those things difficult, to say the least. I can hear Naomi saying to Ruth, don't you know where your worth lies? Not with where we are, not with what we had, and certainly not with me, because at this point, I am worth nothing. I'm wondering if any of you have ever felt like Naomi does in this moment. Have you ever felt like you've gotten the short end of the stick, like somehow the life you'd imagined, planned for, worked for, has not turned out the way that you wanted it to? Empty, just like Naomi felt? Maybe because of life circumstances, you have begun to feel worthless or unwanted or unable to love again. 
In Naomi's reality, her worth had been defined her whole life by others, by her husband, by her ability to have children, by her ability to keep them alive and cared for, and in all of these things, she has failed. And now she's old. It's not like she can go out and get married and have children again to gain back her worth. What she had is gone. Have you ever felt like that? I think imagining ourselves as Naomi, putting ourselves in her place, helps us to see that so much of where we locate our worth is an expectation. So much of where we find acceptance is when others determine that we are acceptable. It's crazy and really a little unbelievable when you really start to think about it, how often we go there, defining ourselves through the lens of another, through the lens of the world. We construct our identities based on the basis of what is expected of us, believing that our worth can be decided by those who think they know us. As one writer I read this week put it, Naomi puts us face to face with those moments when any sort of living out of your heart is immediately shut down by those who have told you how to feel. Those times when your truth has been determined by a so-called truth from the outside. Those times when emptiness is the only thing you feel and when you are really and truly convinced that you are not enough. Naomi gives us a voice to name when we have lost everything that mattered or everything we thought mattered and can't figure out how to make the switch to name the unbearable minutes and seconds when you sense that who you are and who you could be is slipping through your fingers, to name when you are being pulled apart and when you can see the pieces of yourself drifting away. It's here, in this place, that Ruth steps up for Naomi. It's here that Ruth says to her, Whither thou goest, I will go. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. It's here that Ruth doesn't make her decision based on the world's view of Naomi's worth, or even Naomi's view of Naomi's worth. She bases it on her love for Naomi. And here's the thing. Ruth shows this unbelievable faithfulness to Ruth, this unexpected dedication and love. She gives up her life, her possibilities, her future, her security, all for Naomi. But it doesn't, at least in the very beginning, seem to make it any easier or any more possible for Naomi to see herself worthy of this kind of hesed, this kind of loving kindness. Because it's after Ruth says all this to her that she tells the people to change her name from pleasant to bitter. I think it's particularly appropriate that today is the day when we hear the story of Ruth and Naomi, because it's also the day we celebrate all saints. This is the day we remember that we are, as St. Paul says, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's the day we remember all of the people God has sent into our lives who give us a glimpse of the kind of love God has for us. We remember the grandmothers who sang us Jesus Loves Me, the spouses who loved us despite our falls, the children who had a world left of possibilities before they were gone. All of them give us a glimpse of what it means to participate in the kind of hesed life that Ruth offers Naomi. It is also a day that we remember each of us are at times saint and sinner. We remember that none of us are perfect in that sense of the word saint but that God offers us his faithfulness, his loving kindness, his hesed anyway. There are days when we will all feel like Ruth, able to say to those we love, whither thou goest, I will go. And there are days where we will feel like Naomi, unable to feel worthy of the faithfulness someone else offers us. But in each and every one of those days, God says to us, whither thou goest, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. You are mine. Who you are, who you have been, and who you will and can be, I love with my whole heart forever and always. I will be your God, and you will be my people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.